Hello and welcome to today's webinar in the Center for Global Business Leadership Research Network's webinar series, New Ways of Seeing. Our speaker today is Dr. Nathan Eva. Nathan isn't simply a senior lecturer in the Department of Management, Monash Business School. He is in fact a multi-award winning senior lecturer in the Department of Management, Monash Business School. His area of research is leadership, and I'm glad to know that he isn't here today to introduce to us yet another style of leadership. Because in Nathan's view, uh, there are probably already enough. And so us academics need to just chill and take a good look at this sort of smorgasbord of leadership styles to see which of them is really having a unique and meaningful impact on employees in organizations. So that's gonna be the subject of Nathan's talk today. Uh, please enjoy. Please feel free to ask questions using the chat function or raise your hand and you'll be given access to um, verbalize your question at the end of the presentation. Okay, thank you and over to you, Nathan. Thank you so much, Kuya. Just to double check, you've got uh, the slides up on the screen all beautifully. Fantastic. Thank you all for coming today. I really do appreciate it. Hope you're enjoying your lunch. Uh, before I start, I do want to acknowledge the people of the Kulin Nations on whose land that I'm presenting on today and specifically to recognise the influence that um, First Nations people have had on our understanding of leadership, especially in collective forms of leadership and how leadership can go and build communities, which to pay my respects to their elders past and present. As Kuya was saying, that this is a project that uh, we've been thinking about for a while. Uh, it started when Josh and I were talking um, and Josh was going, well, why are there so many different types of leadership? And I really struggled to give him an answer. Uh, so it was something that Josh and I, the last couple of years, have started to explore. And we've brought along um, two amazing professors in Professor Robert Lydon from um, uh, the United States and Professor Alexandra Morin from Canada along for the ride as well. So we do appreciate their, uh, their contribution. But I wanted to start off because I, uh, I woke up last night and I had this dream. I had this dream that I was there with my apologies, my screen has frozen. There we go, there he is, Fauci's there. Last night, I dreamt uh, that I was going to Dr. Fauci and I was going for my COVID vaccine. And I said to me, okay, uh, Fauci, give me the vaccine. And he goes, Nathan, well, there's 66 different vaccines um, that you can take. And listen, all of them are roughly, the, um, are roughly just as effective as each other. So I asked Fauci, well, you're making me choose. He's like, yeah, and I'm like, well, you know, what does the research say? He said to me, well, there's hundreds of articles on which each of the vaccines in the top medical journals, and they're all saying, well, roughly the same thing and demonstrating the same sort of efficacy with uh, uh, preventing COVID. So I pressed further being, uh, you know, being curious, going, well, are there any meta-analyses or are there studies that compare these different vaccines? And he's gone, well, you know, there's some, there's four or, on five, four or five of the vaccines, but they conclude there's minor differences than any. So I asked him, Fauci, well, Fauci, why do we need 66 different types of vaccines? If they all roughly do the same thing, why do we need thousands of articles telling us that they're effective in isolation, but you can't tell me what is the most effective? What is, what is more effective? And Fauci just looked at me and he said, well, Nathan, if you can get away in leadership um, by having 66 different theories that are theoretically rather than empirically different, well, why can't I get away with it in medicine? I had nothing to say. I just had to walk out there without my vaccine. We wouldn't accept this from medicine. We wouldn't accept from medical science to say that, you know, there's 66 uh, different medicines out there. They're roughly all the same. Um, and we, would, we wouldn't expect medicine journals to continue to publish the exact same thing, um, slightly changing bits and pieces. So why do we expect industry to listen to leadership academics if we keep presenting the exact same theories time and time again while just showing slight different differences. So for those of you who haven't been in and around leadership theory, I wanted to give you an idea of where we are very quickly. So there's at least um, 66 different theories of leadership. This was put together by Jessica Din and colleagues in 2014, and there's been more that have come out since then. And each of them tries and works out, well, what is the best way to lead? 
And a lot of our current understanding, it starts with early transformational, transactional, charismatic and leader member exchange theories um, from Bass, Burns and House. And a lot of these things so that you'll find those in your airport bookstores. Then we had things like the global financial crisis, we had Enron. And so a lot of these theories drew criticisms because they didn't deal with ethics. They didn't deal with the nuances of modern 21st century life. So we had theories pop up like ethical leadership, like authentic leadership, like servant leadership. And all of these increased in popularity. For example, I'm mainly a servant leadership researcher and we have over 300 articles already on servant leadership. But they weren't alone. This was alongside other theories such as participative leadership, paternalistic leadership and entrepreneurial leadership. And they all argued that, oh, well, we're unique in certain contexts or in certain outcomes, we're unique. However, the way in which a lot of these are set up is they argue, well, we're theoretically distinct from others, that, you know, we focus on this narrow niche little part. Um, and that's what makes us unique. That's what makes us different. Sometimes they might demonstrate that they are empirically different from something like transformational leadership, but they don't try and distinguish themselves from other particular theories. So you had things um, emerge as the literature continues on and more and more leadership theories just popped up and sprung up everywhere until we have saturated the field with different leadership theories. So Josh was right to ask me, well, what is the one best way to lead? And can these leadership theories exist together? This is called, uh, the name for this is called construct proliferation, that we have proliferated only with constructs, a whole heap of leadership constructs. And I think this is best summed up by David Day. He argued that by simply placing a new leadership construct, um, slightly new but related into a conceptual framework in which another construct has already demonstrated empirical relationship, we might not be learning that much about the new context or consequences of leadership. For me, I think back to the studies on leadership, trust and performance. Uh, in the late 90s, there was this great meta-analysis that looked at all these studies on leadership and they were able to demonstrate that good leadership um, increased trust in uh, followers, which then led to performance. And that was in the late 90s. In the 20 years that have continued, we've seen the exact same model analysed with things like servant, ethical, entrepreneurial, participative, um, transformational, LMX, all these different approaches to leadership. They've all analysed it individually, they haven't compared against other theories, and they've all found roughly the same thing. And all these publications are sitting in top journals. This is consequential because we need to be moving the leadership field forward. Because as leadership scholars, we're sitting there and we're bickering over 10% incremental variance while the world's going through some very serious leadership crises. Um, you know, maybe someone who was talking before me uh, is uh, demonstrating that we're under a very significant uh, leadership challenge right now. We need to step up as leadership scholars, as leadership educators, as leadership practitioners. We need to step up, step up and question this field. Because if it is left unquestioned, we're going to continue to publish the same studies again and again and again, and we're not going to get um, we're not going to get to where organisational bodies and political bodies need us right now. So, if we're thinking about well, what does make a leadership approach unique? What is um, how does it distinguish itself from other approaches? Uh, there are three key things here that it needs to be clearly articulated and not defined by what it does. So you know, it not by increasing performance, but what behaviours does the leader show? It needs to be clearly distinguished from other related constructs in the leadership literature. And there's very few great examples of doing this. There are a couple of seminal papers for different approaches to leadership that um, might compare themselves to three or four different theories, theoretically, but definitely not across the whole gamut. Um, and they need to be empirically distinguishable from each other. But if we're talking about this particular leadership approach and by demonstrating this approach it's going to increase your organizational performance by 10 percent well how is that going to be different than a, another leadership approach there have been four empirical attempts to distinguish these theories and i want to touch on those right now um, so here are some uh here are the uh, four different approaches I'm not going to go through all this, but I want to just touch on a couple of key areas here. The Daru in 2011 started to look at the leadership field and analysed all these studies together. And they said, well, you know, when we actually break this down, certain leadership traits and behaviours, they're losing a lot of their predictive validity. 
Um, they were able to find that task and change-oriented leadership was a better um, predictor of group performance, and relational and passive leadership were better predictors of leadership satisfaction. Um, you then had the bank's meta-analyses, and they analysed the difference between transformational and um, authentic leadership. They found that they were very similar. They found that it was um, roughly about 70% was pretty much the same. They were said that, well, listen, authentic's a little bit better for things like organisational citizenship behaviour, so going above and beyond for the organisation. But for transformational leadership, maybe um, it predicts group performance a little bit better. Banks and colleagues did this again in 2018, but they added servant leadership and authentic leadership. And they also questioned, well, should we be doing this when these leadership theories are all highly correlated? They seem to be saying the exact same thing. Sorry, someone's knocking at my door, as you can, uh, as you can hear right now. Uh, the wonders of working from home. I'll uh, see them a little bit later. So the, um, the final meta-analysis here um, that I want to point out is the Julie Hock meta-analysis. It has demonstrated that transformational, authentic, servant and ethical leadership, they were highly correlated with each other. But, and as a servant leadership researcher, I focused, on, um, I focused on this point too, that they said, well, you know, servant leadership, it might explain an additional 12% variance over transformational leadership. However, they missed one important part of this meta-analysis. They didn't compare servant with ethical or ethical with authentic or servant with authentic. They kept referring everything back to transformational by essentially saying that, well, you know, if you hold up transformational as the gold standard of leadership is the best type of leadership well, yeah, some of these different approaches demonstrate just an incremental bit of variance over those. But they didn't compare those different theories together. So maybe those theories are saying the exact same thing. So I presented that to Josh and he said, well, I think I actually have a solution to this. Um, I've been working on something called Biofactor Exploratory Structural Equation Modeling, or BSEM. Um, and he's got, well, I think that this might be the solution to what we need to do here. So what this essentially does is it says, okay, you've got all these different leadership theories. What's the commonalities? What are the same things? For those of you who don't um, work with leadership scales, I think when we measure transformational leadership, we ask about vision. We also ask about, you know, the leader's vision when we talk about authentic leadership, when we talk about servant leadership. We also talk about ethics a lot of the time in these scales. So a lot of these answers, if your manager's high on vision in transformational leadership, chances are they're high in vision in servant leadership as well. So what this um, methodological approach does is it pulls that shared variance, all that commonalities of that leadership approach together. And what it leaves over is the bits that make servant leadership unique, the bits that make participative leadership unique, the bits that make abusive supervision unique. Um, and so the idea is that in our equations, in our um, modeling of, this, of these leadership approaches, that we could have the general factor of leadership, our G factor, as we're calling it here. And we could also have the leftover shared variance of servant, authentic and the like, and be able to see, well, what is demonstrating a unique predictor over a, um, a group of outcomes? So that's essentially what we try to do, to demonstrate, well, what is this one best way of leading? So, we broke this down as comprehensively as we could. So um, we focused on 13 leadership theories as opposed to the 66, and I'll explain that in the next slide. And we um, looked at predicting 53 different outcomes. So things like performance, satisfaction, trust, well-being, and the like, a whole heap of different things here. We used eight separate samples. We had 4,000 respondents across four countries. We used multiple organizational contexts. So we broke it down into, to make it manageable, into this idea of three studies. The first study was two US samples. The first one's around 300 um, workers, people working full time, and we analysed 12 different outcomes with that. The second one was over 500 US workers analysing 13 outcomes. We then said, okay, well, we've set this up in the US. What happens if we try and look at it in a different country? Because a lot of leadership research says, well, you know, uh, this has worked in US, but does it work in China? Does it work in Saudi Arabia? Does it work in Germany? So we looked at 500 employees, or slightly over, from India, who were born in India, lived in India, and work in India to make sure that we're focused on people who are fit into that cultural area. Um, we also did this in, uh, in Germany, in German. We also did this in um, Brazil, in Portuguese, to try and tease out where these cultural variances might come in. Finally, we looked at different 
contexts because leadership is going to be different in different organizations, right? So we looked at banking, we looked at government and non for profit and we looked at hospitality. So we asked some similar questions, um, uh, similar outcomes across each of these three different contexts and then asked some specific questions. For example, like in banking, high stress jobs. So let's look at job stress. In government, well, you know, a lot of people would um, be motivated to work in the public service. So let's ask that. And in hospitality, we talked about things like surface climate and service sabotage. So we tried to get a holistic view and be able to work out, okay, there are going to be certain areas where certain leadership approaches are going to work better. At least that's what we were thinking. So it was impractical to try and put 66 measures in because that would have been over a thousand questions. It was hard enough to get people to sit down and answer 13 um, leadership measures, let alone um, 66. So we went to some experts to ask their opinion. So we examined past leadership meta-analyses that I presented before and worked out what are the things that are um, demonstrating key outcomes. We examined the leadership field. Um, so um, I had large reviews or meta-analyses to be able to see what is currently being talked about, what is the most, what is the most important. Um, and then also started to look at, well, what are these sort of the new theories that are coming up that might be important in a couple of years time that might not be just as important now. So something like entrepreneurial leadership was something we picked up there. We also contacted a panel of five leadership experts and asked them to give us the names of about 10 to 15 leadership theories that they saw as being particularly important, emerging or needed to be examined concurrently. So once we had all that data, we narrowed it down to 13 uh, leadership approaches, which we believed were going to be the most important and probably ones that could predict out some um, strong outcomes. In terms of the outcome measures, uh, we looked at traditional things measured in leadership literature, positive and negative attitudes, behaviours, workplace, um, uh, workplace performance, perceptions of the leader and psychological states like wellbeing and burnout. Um, study two, we use the same six outcomes across different cultures. So we could start to see and make cultural inferences. And with study three, as I was talking before, we used specific industry outcomes. Just one second. So as a positive, across the eight samples, we did see a clear G factor emerge. So there was... Um, so we were able to see a shared variance between a lot of these leadership approaches. Um, in general, a lot of the positive items loaded strongly onto this G factor. So a lot of items from things like servant transformational, ethical, authentic. Um, a lot of the negative items from abusive supervision loaded negatively on the G factor. So negative or positive. Um, and something like authoritarian leadership uh, was generally weak and it sort of moved between positive and negative loadings, which makes a lot of sense considering the nature of authoritarian leadership and how that is seen. Um, in analyzing how this G factor was made up, it was very clear that it represented this idea of good leadership. So um, looking after your employees, being good at your job, uh, being ethical, those sort of things that, um, that the shared variance was around this good leadership and then there was these unique characteristics on the side. And I do just want to reiterate this, that the G factor is this general shared good leadership, what is common across all these different leadership approaches. What is left over at that stage in the analyses is what makes servant leadership unique, what makes authentic leadership unique, abusive supervision unique, authoritarian leadership unique. So in order to demonstrate that it is an impactful theory on the literature, it needed to demonstrate predictive validity. It needed to predict an outcome once you account for this shared general good leadership factor. So what happened? Not a lot. Uh, none of the leadership theories regularly demonstrated any variance above and beyond the G factor. So we tested 53 relationships and 47 of those, the G factor, that shared variance, that thing that made all those leadership theories the exact same, came out on top. That was the most important thing. Uh, there were, and I'll touch, touch on these in the uh, slides coming up, there were some bits and pieces that came out through some stuff like abusive supervision, paternalistic leadership, um, which demonstrated that there might be some really interesting relationships to explore there. But I want you to look down at the bottom of this table. The theories that are a big problem in this proliferation, things like um, transformational, authentic, ethical, servant, instrumental, they um, very rarely were demonstrating any impact above and beyond the shared leadership, um, this shared leadership G factor. 
And that started to worry me about where we're going in terms of leadership, because it was very clear from these studies that there is no gold standard. There is no clear way that this is the best way of leading, because all positive leadership theories, they're capturing the exact same information. However, we did have some exceptions here. Abusive supervision, so uh, predicted 28 of the 53 outcomes and authoritarian as well, 13 of the 53, but these were generally low outcomes. So it was things like predict negatively predicting performance or predicting people wanting to turn over their jobs, or predicting burnout. So uh, there seemed to be something going on in that negative side compared to the good side. Charismatic leadership generally predicted negative outcomes, so high burnout, low performance. And for those of you who have studied or looked at charismatic leadership and followed it over the years, this makes a lot of sense, right? That once you take out all those shared good parts of charismatic leadership, it's all the dark side of charismatic leadership that, um, you know, people like Torish and um, Avolio have warned us about. Uh, that, you know, when we talk about the Jim Joneses of the world, that um, as charismatic as they are, there are some negative outcomes that come with that. Paternalistic leadership was... Um, was really interesting. It predicted some good outcomes and some um, bad outcomes. And that was really, uh, it mirrored what was going on in that literature, um, that paternalistic leadership doesn't work for everyone. It's good, it has its good and it's bad. What was interesting was it regularly predicted trust and commitment, um, which is something that might be worth considering as we continue to look at this. LMX did play a nice role with 22 out of the 53 outcomes predicted, and it might be what, it, what it's saying here is that relationship between the leader and follower is something that's unique and could be quite interesting to explore a little bit more. And as I said on the last slide, the remaining theories, um, they only, uh, they demonstrate very few significant relationships um, and above and beyond a G factor. It indicates that these theories bring almost no added benefit above and beyond each other. That once you pull together what is common between those theories, the bits that make them unique might not actually be predicting outcomes the way in which we thought they would. So the literature is starting to tell us that leadership might just be black and white and a little bit of grey. Um, we know that good leadership is predicting good outcomes. It just doesn't matter what sort of good leadership. And that's really important for leadership development, leadership training and leadership research as well. Because empirically, there might be very little benefit in exploring the same model across cultures or exploring um, the exact same model with uh, bringing in a different leadership approach and trying it out. So for example, and this is a big one that I know when I'm reviewing papers, I see quite a lot is that um, with ethical leadership, they go and say, oh, well, you know, ethical leadership, it works in the US, but we're now gonna try it in Saudi Arabia because it's culturally different and no doubt it is. But empirically, it seems that it is good leadership leading to the exact same outcomes in roughly the same sort of relationship. So if it's probably redundant because we know that this already exists and it, uh, it really opens up a can of worms for a lot of our leadership research that tends to like to replicate uh, leadership approaches across, uh, across countries without thinking deeply about what makes that country or that what makes that culture different. Beyond good leadership, there might also be a bad factor because we had the majority of these ones that predicted above and beyond a G factor or predicted unique variants outside of the G factor tended to predict negative outcomes. So things like abusive supervision, authoritarianism, paternal, um, paternalistic leadership. Um, so what might be going on here is that we've got a nice, really good, good leadership factor and a bad leadership factor, and there's not much else in between. And so future research, maybe looking at this bad leadership factor might be, um, might be something that's quite interesting. So what does this all mean, Nathan? What does this all mean as we've all got it together? Well, it's important for all of us who are doing leadership research and engaging in leadership education, because this is the responsibility of all leadership scholars. Um, there are too many theories that are essentially old wine and new wine bottles, and we only have ourselves to blame. Uh, a lot of this has to do with our lax construct validity standards that have led to having an oversaturation of leadership theories in the same lead, um, theoretical space because we allow people to get away with saying, well, it's different than transformational leadership, therefore it is unique. Um, so the way, what we're saying here is that, well, once you put it all together, um, 
it seems that the way in which we've validated our measures have been inadequate and we, we must improve the way in which we do research to get there. So it's no longer appropriate just to compare one or two leadership theories against each other and saying, well, you know, they're theoretically distinct. So if you're looking at bringing in a new leadership approach or if you're looking at creating a new set of leadership training, what I would say is um, I'd like you to follow this. It is impractical to add all 13 um, leadership approaches that we use, or let alone the 66, into a survey to measure um, if your new approach or your approach to leadership is demonstrating above and beyond other factors. But we do think that a concise G factor, good measure of leadership, um, could be the answer here that could be used to be developed, which incorporates all of this shared variance that's going on with the leadership. Until we've got that measure, the onus is on you. If you want to introduce a new idea into the leadership field, if you want to introduce a new theory, if you want to introduce a new theory into development, the onus is on you to um, demonstrate the incremental variance against as many leadership theories as humanly possible and demonstrate to the field that what you're looking at, that your particular area plays an important and currently undocumented role within the context that's being studied. Because without it, studies like the one we've got here, the meta-analyses, they're demonstrating that there's level, little evidence to suggest that any approach to leadership is different than the ones that have come before it. The question I have gotten on this um, is going, well, you know, my measure is theoretically different. I've said that, you know, my, um, the way in which I look at leadership is theoretically different. Do I get a free pass because of that? Well, no, not quite. And that's been a big issue, is that there's been great validation papers that have said, oh, you know, this is how we distinguish ourselves from transformational. This is how we distinguish ourselves from ethical. Um, and they argue throughout this is that, well, if we take all these 66 approaches and we reduce it down, aren't we missing this theoretical richness, this, um, this beautiful development of theory? Well, yes, um, yes, we are. But we're talking about the empirical... Um, the empirical outcomes of our, of our studies. If, if we're showing that your leadership approach actually has an impact, well, how are you going to show that? The other pushback is saying, well, you know, isn't uh, got more to do with imperfect survey measures, that surveys are the problem, that it's not, you know, my theoretical development of leadership, it's the survey, the survey is the issue. Well, then let's just get rid of surveys. Let's get rid of surveys tomorrow. Um, that's done, oh, we'll uh, finish surveys today. Uh, everyone will have more time, uh, time in their day. Um, but again, we know that that's probably not possible, that people are still going to continue to do surveys. So again, I say, well, the onus is then on the person who's putting together this survey to demonstrate the incremental variance. Um, alternatively, leadership scholars might use different measures, such as live experiments with actors demonstrating what is very uniquely about servant, what is very uniquely different about transformational, and being able to use it that way. Uh, in a time where we can't be in the same room together, maybe this is an online experiment with um, videos and actors and engaging in our games. There are other ways to demonstrate the impact of leadership rather than just using surveys. So where do we go with this? Um, I think it's important to remember that leaders are complex, that leaders are not just one type of leader, they're not just a transformational, not just a servant, they're not just an authentic, that they're makeups of all of them. And a lot of the time, our research doesn't speak to that. We live in complex times and we need these complex theories. So one possible solution is to strip this all back and go back to what are the fundamental building blocks of leadership theory. Is that going back to the task and relational and change and controlling behaviours and ethical behaviours? Um, and that might be a nice way to start to build this all together. Because in that sort of way, we can use things like a person-centred approach, where instead of saying, you know, to what extent is someone a transformational leader, we could say, well, to what extent does someone show a bit of transformation, a little bit of um, paternalistic, a little bit of ethical leadership? And you might be able to demonstrate that people who engage in a little bit of paternalistic and ethical leadership are going to have different outcomes on performance and people who engage in a lot of transformation, a little bit of ethical. And that might be a more holistic way to address leadership development as well. So for those of you who aren't leadership researchers, we'd be sitting there going, well, Nathan, what does this mean for me? Have I wasted all my money on snake oil leadership courses? No, you haven't. 
leadership development is incredibly important and leadership training actually does make a difference. It does make you a better leader. It impacts your team and your organisation. And there is a great study that brings all of this together. It's in the um, Journal of Applied Psychology. The references there, I'm happy to give anyone a copy if they want to email me later. Um, but what I would say is probably doesn't matter what leadership approach that you're trained in, that being trained in neuro leadership or being trained in um, uh, adaptive leadership, it's all pretty much going to have the same sort of effect. Uh, the results of our study show that just basic things, being good at your job, having a compelling vision, being there for your employees, especially during times of COVID, being ethical and not being abusive, these are just really great places to start that are going to have a significant impact on your organisation. So my parting word of advice, learn as much as you can from a variety of sources. Um, go to different trainings, read different books, engage in different webinars, take what you like and leave what you don't. If someone is telling you that there is a one best way to lead, that their course is, going, is the best way, that they've demonstrated beyond doubt that if you go and pay $10,000 for this course, you are going to be the greatest leader of all time, ask them for the empirical evidence and not just against one different approach, but ask them, do you have the empirical evidence that is better than multiple different approaches to leadership? Because if they can't provide that evidence to you, keep walking, because no one wants to pay good money for snake oil. Thank you so much for all coming along today. I really appreciate it. If you want to, um, if you've got questions, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, and if you wanted any uh, references from today, just uh, shoot me an email. I'm happy to send those through to you. Thank you so much. Kia, I'll, um, uh, I'll let you handle any sort of Q&A questions that come through. Sure, thanks, that was really interesting. And thanks for not introducing another leadership. <laughs> so we have um, a couple of questions here in the, in the Q&A. Um, so I'll just put those to you, Nathan, and, um, and we, we can discuss these. So Donald is asking, well, stating, in crises, quick, decisive and sometimes authoritarian leadership are required to survive and turn organizations around. What is your take on that? That is a very good um, question, Donald. Sorry, I was just trying to find uh, the stop sharing button. Um, occasionally does that, doesn't it, with Zoom that uh, doesn't give you what you want. Um, so, you, yeah, 100%, you make a very good point. There's some good research out there that demonstrates that um, in times of crises that this authoritarian, um, a little bit of command and control, uh, this is what I need you to do and this is what I need you to do now, that it does have, uh, it does have a place. Um, it's one of those things that specifically I can talk about it within the context of this study, that at a long term it has negative, it has negative uh, impacts on organisational performance, on wellbeing and the like. Um, we know from previous studies that it does have a short term, uh, a short term impact. Uh, in terms of, say, the leadership development side of this, what I would be, what I would be saying to, um, to you is use it sparingly and make sure you're explaining to your employees what you're doing. That if you're gone from someone who is a very engaging, a very um, empowering uh, leader to straight away authoritarian because of what's going on with the COVID crisis, uh, that that culture shock for employees can have significant negative effects. So just explain to them why you're going into this sort of mode and what's going on. Um, I hope that that sort of touches on the, touches on the answer of your question, Donald. But happy to happy to um, chat further. Nathan, somebody has virtually raised their hand, and so Shahab is going to. Um let them in to ask a question. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks, Kuya. Can you hear me? Yes? Yes. Yes. Hi, Nathan. This is Shabab. How are you? Good, Thanks. Matt. How are you? Not too bad. That was a really good presentation. Just a couple of quick questions. Probably a bit of a no brainer, but it's worth getting your view on this. Did the, the 13 uh, odd uh, leadership uh, theories that you used, did they share the same sort of epistemological or an, or an ontological assumptions and given that we're trying to assess what is the best leadership approach should we be considering 
the ontological and epistemological, epistemological assumptions in, in assessing that question? That is a really great question, Shabab. And I will say to anyone who didn't understand half those words, it's all right. Uh, I've, I've only got a good uh, small grasp of them myself. Um, so, uh, Shabab, I'll say that they all come from a uh, positivist view that a lot of the uh, leadership research comes from psychology. And so it's very much uh, sort of if I do this, this is the outcome that um, what Shabab's getting at there is, well, Nathan, isn't, don't we need to take into account uh, greater context, greater understandings um, of the world around us that different people are going to have different views on what is effective leadership and don't we need to explore that too? 100% Shabab, 100% um, that, uh, that taking into account a lot of different views and so things, you know, contextual things like gender, age, race, none of that was, while it was controlled for in our study, none of it was... Um, was picked apart. None of that was really delved into. And yes, it's definitely a limitation of uh, the leadership research, um, of our research in general. Um, but what we really wanted to focus on is uh, is speak to where the leadership where leadership is in terms of research and where leadership practitioners are in terms of what's what's going on in the in the classroom. Being able to look at those particular theories that were at uh, least able to be studied um, uh, through surveys, through quantitative methods. Um, so I, for one, am uh, someone who definitely from my own leadership education practice is looking to engage with more uh, complexity um, and uh, construction of how people see and view and engage um, in leadership. Uh, it's quite hard to be able to do that um, in this sort of study. But um, uh, Shabab, I think you bring up um, absolutely fantastic points and something that uh, really leadership leadership research needs to grapple with a lot more than it currently does. So thanks for bringing it up, mate. Thanks, Shabab. We have a question from Dr. Ahmed, who's asking, are you talking about political leadership or bureaucratic leadership or other forms of leadership? And how do you measure the G factor? No worries. Uh, we talked about a whole, um, it's, we talk about a whole heap of different types of leadership um, there, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, so for the majority of it, it was within organisations. So we did use a couple of different um, public sector organisations um, through the public sector one. But in general, again, speaking specifically to what's going on um, in the field, which is around organisations, around managing organisations. Uh, so you would say closer to bureaucracy, bureaucratic leadership, but also within, you know, sort of management organisations and the like, rather than looking at the uh, the President Trumps, the Prime Minister Ardern's and Morrison's of the world. How do you measure the G factor? Uh, it's through bifactor structural equation modelling. And I will bore everyone if I continue to go into that um, in depth, that there are some um, great uh, papers on how to do that. I'd specifically check out Josh Howard's work on this. Um, if you just uh, chuck his name into Google, you'll be able to find some um, papers that explain it really, really well. But essentially, it's using a um, statistical tool to look at the shared variance between those approaches. If you're familiar with something like an exploratory factor analysis or confirmatory factor analysis, it's pretty much the same there. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, Professor Kevin Lowe is in the house and he <laughs> oh, no. is asking whether uh, the G factor and its negative partner are similar to the leader prototype and anti-leader prototypes identified in implicit leadership theories. And is the G factor more trait-based or behavior-based or a combination? Easy questions come from the audience, KK. Easy questions. Um, thank you so much for dropping past, Kevin. Really, really appreciate it. Um, that is a really, really good question. Um, the short answer is I don't know. I I don't know. I think that there. I think you definitely could be arguing that that um, the ways in which we look at leadership and ways in which we study leadership and measure leadership are what we prototypically think of as leaders. So, you know, when we talk about charismatic leadership, I think that's a great example of proto, um, the prototype of leadership. And is the G factor more trait-based or behavioural-based or a mix mixture of the two? Um, I'm just thinking through my head, it's actually a pretty good mixture of the two. I think it's slightly more um, uh, trait rather... Uh, oh, sorry, no, sorry. Um, I was... Uh, 
I was thinking task or relational oriented. No, it is definitely more behavioral based. A lot of these theories are more behavior, uh, come from the behavioral school of leadership as opposed to a trait um, school of leadership. So we'd be playing more in sort of the behavioral based theories. So similar to you know the transformational, transactional, uh, participative and the like. Professor Cooper, our residence uh, stats expert, is asking how can leadership measures be improved in the future? If I knew that answer, I would retire, Brian. Um, so I'm, I think that, I don't think it's an issue of how do leadership measures improve. I think it's stepping back even further and saying, well, how does, how we categorise leadership improve? Um, so a scale is going, a scale is going to measure um, whatever the particular thing is. And, you know, a lot of people who do sort of uh, positive psychology or core self-evaluation, they seem to not be struggling with the same construct proliferation that we do. And so there's a possibility that it's not just the scale that's an issue, that it's going back further and saying, well, um, getting the definitions right, getting the differences between the approaches right, or at least being able to work out how we take what we've got and integrate that together. I definitely encourage more and more people who are doing leadership research to be looking at experimental work. Um, I'm playing a lot with video experiments at the moment. I'm really enjoying it. Um, so I would be encouraging people to move down those paths, but definitely be taking that step back and thinking, how do we actually think about leadership? And maybe that goes nicely to Kevin's point and Shabab's point as well. Um, maybe the ways in which we've thought about leadership in this positivist uh, view are inherently flawed. Uh, an anonymous person is just wondering why there's so much bad leadership since most of the time we can only remember bad leaders in our jobs. Um, yes, I'm just having a read through that uh, question there. Um, so I, I'm not an exact expert on this psychology. Um, so Kuya, just correct me um, where I'm wrong here, but we tend to remember things that are bad. Um, then we do those um, positive experiences is kind of why we, you know, uh, always fixate on sort of the negative things that have, that have happened. So um, my understanding, it's a psychological process. Um, again, if the psychologists, please, uh, please correct me. Um, and why do we, why is there a prevalence of bad leaders? It's because they're really good at taking the spotlight that there are so many great leaders out there who are leading organizations who just don't care about the spotlight and aren't being uh and they don't make good media stories because they're just doing what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis and it's a little bit of select selective attention there um and uh and that's what i would say that we tend to be drawn to those they tend to be the ones that come out through the media um a little bit more but um does it feel like there's more and more bad leaders every day it really really does um, and, you know, hopefully with all the people on at the moment who are, um, there's a lot of leadership practitioners on right now who are doing, um, you know, working day in, day out to make sure that we have, we have a um, society of good leaders and, uh, you know, um, thank you for all the hard work that you're all doing. Can I just jump in, Nathan, and just also ask out of my own curiosity, mm -hmm. when you say like good and bad, do you mean like good, bad as in effective, ineffective or moral, immoral? So like is President Trump a bad leader or is he a bad leader? <laughs> um, I'm, uh, I tend, especially considering I'm recording, I'm not going to, um, uh, geez, no, I feel like I really should. Uh, no, um, we look at it more in terms of uh, immoral versus moral is probably not the words that I would use, but I think liked versus unliked or kind versus um, non-kind or competent versus non-competent. So the stuff that was good tends to be um, are ethical, have a compelling vision for the future, you know, focus on, focus on me as, a, um, as an employee. And the bad ones are, and you probably know these um, questions a little bit better than I do considering your research on abusive supervision, but, you know, ridicules me, um, is, you know, puts me down in front of others, uh, things like sort of the passive ones doesn't, you know, get up to help me and the like. So I guess, I guess the way in which I, we sort of phrase this as good as in competent ability generally not a terrible human um, versus a, uh, a person you might have mentioned before. Cool. Thank you. Uh, Shireen is wondering um, how you determined which theory or leadership style um, that you used. And that's okay. I can answer. Yeah, I can answer that one. 
Um, so the, throughout the leadership literature, there are approaches, so I, I've mentioned a heap of them on the call today, um, that tend to get used again and again and again. And where our issue comes through with the leadership literature in terms of both research and also going in practice is that all of these seem to be doing separate things that are pretty much the same, but aren't talking to each other. So um, in terms of how do we determine which theory or which style was used in which particular case? So what we did is that um, each of the people who sat down and did the survey, they went through some screening questions about, you know, how long have you worked for your manager? How often do you speak to them? Making sure that they were regularly engaging with their manager and had known them for quite a while, um, so over a year. And then they were asked a series of questions. And so each of these leadership approaches that I've talked about are broken up um, and are measured by somewhere between six and 15 or 18 questions um, that have been pre-established by other researchers and um, who, and they answer each one of those questions. And the idea is that if you say, certain leadership is one I'm most familiar with, um, if you answer high in these sort of six questions and you say, my leader um, puts, puts um, me above themselves, that you know, talks about giving back to the community, is ethical in their decision, et cetera. As long as that's sort of like in the higher stage, we'd say, oh, well, that person demonstrates um, servant leadership. Um, we didn't ask them to sit there and say, oh, you know, my leader is a authentic leader or a servant leader or a transformational leader. We used yeah, the pre-established measures from that. I hope that answered your question. Uh, Professor Richard Hall is next, Nathan. I like this, Richard. So Richard asks um, that uh, I said that we live in complex times and we need complex hybrid theories, but he sees a key message from your research that actually uh, what we might need is simpler, less complex theories. It really focuses on the elements of the G factor only. Only any thoughts on that? Um, I think that you've absolutely hit a nail on the head, um, Professor Hall. I think that is a really, really good point. Um, I think the way we need to think about leadership needs to be complex. I think that it needs to move past our siloed views of transformational, transactional, um, uh, servant authentic. And this probably gets to, again, Shabab and Kevin's point, thinking about it um, uh, complex, complexly, like by bringing everything together. And once we bring everything together, we can start to, we can start to siphon that down into the into the key um, building blocks that build everything up. Um, so for those of you who haven't engaged in leadership um, literature a lot, that back in the 1960s, they essentially said that there were two things that you were, um, that people were task focused, they're focused on getting things done um, and all people were focused on people. So they're focused on building the relations. Um, what's been quite interesting is we've delved through this data, played through this data a little bit more and played through these items. It still feels that they're the two major parts of leadership being able to get stuff done and being able to look after people. And you're right, maybe if we just go back to focusing on those two things, maybe we're going to be a lot better off. Uh, Hannah's asking about the issue of diversity in workplaces. This is a really good uh, question by Hannah. So Hannah's asked, you know, what implications does it have for diverse workforces and how do we lead diverse employees in organisations and workplace teams? Um, it's a really good question from Han because it probably speaks to the limitations in our in our theorizing that we still think of leadership as one heroic individual who can go and save us um, and even I got to have a listen to some of um, Trump's speech before I jumped on today and he was talking very much that sort of rhetoric I alone can save us um, you know it's either Biden or me um, we need to move away from that rhetoric that the world is way too complex to be thinking that one person can come and do all of this and Han talks um, about it beautifully then when she says well, you know what do we do with diverse work um, forces how do we lead um, diverse workforces well we can't just all say that one person needs to be all and um, be all and end, um, end all uh, that um, myself uh, Kevin Lowe and Julie Wolf from Cox did some research um, and Herman Steve, sorry Herman, um, did some research on uh, collective leadership and we were looking at things like within consulting firms that you're going to be working on projects and not one person isn't going to be an expert on one area. That maybe leadership rather than thinking about it as leadership as Nathan, but how do we share that leadership role? How do we at times, you know, I can pass that leadership role over to Kuya so he can take over when he's got a better knowledge of a particular situation and how is that then passed to Josh or passed to um, Shahab um, and passed back to me. So in hand in asking your questions, I think that um, answering your question, 
I think something more the shared, the collective, the distributed leadership model might be the way forward for a lot of these organisations that are engaging in um, highly complex workforces and highly complex problems. Just have two more questions. Um, Ruth, Ruth is asking about the role of followers. And, um, and maybe you can just lead into this, the last one, which is um, if, if the same leader can exhibit good and bad leadership behaviours. That is a, yeah. Um, so that's a really good question. And so there's a, another question that's just um, popped up as well. So I might try and get all three of those together. Mm -hmm. So where does followership uh, fit into this picture? Um, massively. Massively, followers are the ones who are filling out, um, filling out this survey. That uh, one of the things that we do need to be thinking a lot more about is how followers see leader behaviours. So one of the things that um, I've been uh, working on at the moment um, with Mitch Newbert and M. Hunter and Matt Wood is understanding how followers interpret the signals from their leaders that they're engaging in particular behaviours. So I feel that at times we forget followers a lot, that we like focusing on leaders because they're sexy because it's stuff that gets headlines because you know they're a public face um, so I see that we need to be focusing a lot more on who these followers are and instead of just getting them to answer questions on a survey asking them a little bit more about who they are how they interpret leadership how they see leadership because that's going to have big implications for what we're talking about and so come asks, you know, what's the view on um, female leadership style and how it sits within your research? And so I'm going to just open this more broadly here is, well, how are different leaders seen? Um, and again, going back to the um, prototypicality, uh, the prototypical leader uh, generally in, in the leadership approaches that we've had, and the majority of them written by white males um, and delivered by white males, um, that comes through the leadership literature. And one of the things that we don't do well enough is understand and break down um, how people interpret um, leadership from uh, different sources. Uh, Helena Liu, um, amazing scholar at the University of Technology in Sydney. I think that she's got these, these beautiful papers which talk about people engaging in the exact same leadership approach and just changing the gender or changing the, um, changing the race and people's reactions to them change enormously. It's something that we are still working through as leadership scholars and leadership educators and something we need to think about how we educate leaders to, um, uh, to be able to engage in leadership, to be able to accept leaders from multiple different backgrounds. And um, honestly, we're not doing enough when we haven't done enough and we need to be doing a lot more. So um, the anonymous attendee asks, can good and bad leadership behaviours both be exhibited by the leader at the same time? Yes, yeah. I think that you can. I think you can find this, and you've had some research playing around with this sort of stuff as well. Um, I think that you can find maybe not in the exact same transaction, but you definitely can see leaders who engage in different behaviours based on their moods on different days. Um, or, for example, that they treat different followers in different ways. So how I engage with Kuya might be very different from how I engage with Josh, but Josh is still going to see how I engage with Kuya, and Kuya is going to um, engage with Josh. Do I think that people can exhibit the same, those sort of behaviours? Yes, but it's probably less likely. Kuya, did you want to add anything there? Uh, I just would add that it might also depend on who you're asking. So, for example, in abusive supervision research, usually the follower is asked about the perceptions of the boss being abusive. And so two different people might, um, one person might see a boss as abusive and another might not. So it depends on, you know, from whose perspective you're, you're getting the information. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. Um, no, I'm just going to um, wrap up and just say thank you all for coming um, along today. Really, really appreciate it. It's been something that, yeah, Josh, um, myself, Bob and uh, Alexandra have been working on over the last couple of years. So, you know, it's still developing and still, uh, and still learning. We're still being able to uh, learn more and more. And this was really great getting those questions and it's allowed me to think a lot deeper in this. Um, Thank you all for this. Um, look after yourselves, um, uh, stay safe, and we hope to see you at uh, multiple different uh, Centre for Global Business uh, presentations later on. Thank you, Nathan. And before we finish up, I just want to acknowledge the excellent work of Shahab, who you would have been hearing from 
with with emails about this event and um, yeah he, he works very hard and uh, manages a, a massive workload and honestly he's, he's probably one of the most competent and efficient people that I've worked with and uh, so I just wanted to say thank you Shahab and thank you everyone for attending and um, please um, look out for our next seminar in our seminar series which will be held on September 25th by Associate Professor Dae Jong Choi at the University of Melbourne.